This is Track Talk at the Big M. Hey, did you know that Chuck Sylvester has trained more winners in trotting events of $250,000 up than anybody in the history of harness racing? How about the fact that he's made more Hamiltonian money than any other trainer in the 75-year history of that race? He trained the greatest Yankee of them all, Muscles Yankee, back in 97-98, and he had a three-year-long Mac attack. That's right, Mac LaBelle from 86 to 88, richest male trotting horse of all time. Chuck Sylvester has joined us today. Chuck, how are you doing? Hi, Bob. Now, I know you were in the Hall of Fame a couple years ago. Basically, you got there with a resume from the 80s and 90s. What about the 60s and 70s? What was Chuck Sylvester doing around then? Well, in the early 60s, uh, I never saw my first horse till 1959. It was 19 years old. Uh, so I, kind of, I was working in a trucking business for my father and in college, and I just played with two or three horses. Well, unfortunately, in 1961, he passed away. So I had to stay with three or four horses for part time, and it just took me a long time to really get a stable together. Did you see some of those great Hamiltonians, uh, the Super Bowl and Speedy Crown and uh, Neverly Pride and those kind of uh, great horses? And I saw a few of them race, but I never. I saw Super Bowl when he was two and three, and unfortunately, I never got to see him in the Hamiltonian. Okay, Diamond Exchange is probably generally considered your first really top marquee horse. Uh, can you get to the spot you are without having one of those kind of get notice me type horses? I think, especially with trotters, uh, you better be fortunate enough to get a great horse to beat somebody, so somebody can recognize you. Mac Lobel was one of the great horses we ever had race here, but the Elite Lop is coming up Sunday. Now, tell us about Mac Lobel heading to Sweden for the Elite Lop in 1988. He had a little bit of a mind of his own that week, didn't he? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, uh, that was a tough week for me over there. Uh, we had Brady test breading that winter a few times, and when he went over there, it was new territory for him, and I think he wanted to be a stallion instead of race, and, and it was touch and go all week whether we'd really race or not. And what, what would wind up happening there? Now, he's still, even on race day, it was a little questionable, wasn't it? Yes, uh, on race day, uh, there was a great crowd, 30, 40, 50,000 people there. Uh, he started out walking, and that was the problem. He, he wouldn't do anything but walk. Well, he walked about the first quarter to half a mile, and just lucky for me, some people started cheering, and a horse came by fast and kind of spooked him. And he got off on the trot, and from that point on, uh, his mind went to business then. Let's take a look at Mac LaBelle in the 1987 Hamiltonian. Uh, you had won the first heat uh, by open lengths, but you made a little change going into the final. Tell us about that. Well, the track was very hard that day. It was hot. And right at the wire, he kind of went to pacing. So John said, Jeezy said, you know, we're going to have to nurse him through this. So in the paddock between heats, we said to put a set of full pads on him to give him more, a little more cushion. Now, those days, endurance and speed, probably the two most important things. Today, it seems like there's more emphasis on the latter, speed. Well, you know, we keep breeding for speed. They're more natural, thanks to Super Bowl and Speedy Crown, and now Valley Victory and on down. Uh, horses are easy to train now. Uh, most horses now don't wear any weight anymore. So it's just a matter of who's fortunate enough to get to one that stays sound and has speed enough to, to be the champion. Did Valley Victory change the way you train trotters in the last 10 years? Yeah, I think so. Valley Victory is a horse that was very long. They made it much easier for people to train him. Pine Chip uh, is retired after the 94 season, one of the greatest trotters we ever saw. What, what do you think of him, and what's his status today? Well, Pine Chip now is uh, overseas. He's breeding in uh, Sweden, I guess. Uh, this is his first year over there. Uh, unfortunately for us, uh, the horse had great speed, uh, and he turned out horses with a lot of speed. But uh, some people, I think, overtrained him. They went too fast. And unfortunately, he had a lot of lameness, but Castleman closed up shop last year, so he was sold. 51 time trial still stands, all time fastest trotter. Yeah, I know, and, and believe me, if he'd have been 100%, he'd have went faster that day. Okay, let's take a chance now. If someone can win dinner for two, Chuck Sylvester is joining us here. Your questions and comments, of course, are welcome for him. 1 877 CNA Live. Let's take a look at our quiz. Who was the first trainer in history to win the Metal Lance Pace and the Hamiltonian in consecutive years? And we'll give you a hint Chuck Sylvester is not the answer, although he did it back in 86 and 87 with laughs and Mac LaBelle. Welcome back to Track Talk Live here on CN8 and on TheBigM.com. And uh, I still have to cash that ticket, by the way, but uh, we've got uh, the number to give you right off the bat here, one 877 8 live for questions for Chuck Sylvester, or if you'd like to talk about harness racing. Uh, right off the bat, we want to uh, bring in Scott. Scott, uh, apparently Scott has the answer to the question. Go ahead, Scott. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Scott from Spotswood, New Jersey. Go ahead. Billy Horton? Is it Billy That's Horton? That's right. Yeah, Billy Horton. 1977-78. Green Speed won. And, of course, Hamiltonian came here four years later. And then Falcon Amherst won the second Meadowlands Pace. Good guess. All right. Dinner for two here at the Meadowlands Racetrack for Scott. Uh, Chuck Sylvester with us, a Hall of Fame trainer, uh, with a couple of prospects for this year's Hamiltonian and uh, Chasing Tail. 
and Liverman Hanover. Give us a little update on those two. Well, they both trained today uh, in 2-4. Uh, they both were fine. Uh, we're expecting to train next week between 2-1 and 2-2, and then the following week bring them up to the Meadowlands. I don't know if we're going to qualify or train up here one week, and then we're, we're ready to battle. How important is it to keep them here at the Meadowlands and get them acclimated to this racetrack and to the surroundings here prior to the Hamiltonian prepping for it? Well, I think if you're going to uh, win the Hamiltonian, most of the times you better prep right here at the Meadowlands. Okay, Dan's got a question, maybe for uh, Chuck Sylvester. Go ahead. Yeah, Chuck, uh, we all know that Mac Lobel was probably the best colt you ever trained. Who was the best filly? Well, I had several fillies. Uh, maybe Ambro Devona, uh, Ambro Keepsake, Ambro Fern, all sisters were all great fillies. All right. Bright Light Lobel in there, huh? Bright yeah, Light Bright Light Lobel. Okay. All right, I was reading the uh, article in the uh, uh, Trot, or I should say Hoofbeats magazine, and it spoke about how you examine the uh, yearlings prior to uh, purchase. Uh, what are some of the things you look for confirmation-wise? It also said you look at them on video while they go and, and so on and so forth. Well, the video is very important to make sure horses uh, travel straight. You don't want to see a horse put one leg inside uh, when they're traveling because that's trouble down the road. But as far as confirmation, you want to see a horse to, you know, stand fairly straight or resemble some horse that you had that was very good. I mean, Mac Gobell did not have very good confirmation, and he was a great horse. So if I see a horse that resembles him, I won't be afraid of it. Chuck, okay. 1989 Dead Heat Hamiltonian, uh, where were you watching? And uh, tell us a little bit about the confusion that happened afterwards. Who won and how long it took to get uh, settled? Well, I was in the paddock, and, and as soon as there was dead heat, uh, I was standing around there and quite didn't know what uh, was going to happen. And Andy Grant came to me and said, uh, if it's a dead heat, Chuck, uh, you'll be declared the winner because best in summary. So that relieved me a little then. And then come to find out, it took a long time to, to really become the winner. We've got calls from all across North America. Of course, you can watch this show uh, anywhere in the world, for that matter, on our website. And Lee from Buffalo, New York is with us. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, Chuck, i got a two-part question for you on race strategy. Go ahead. Okay. Part one is um, how much importance, you've been in the New York area for, for years and you know most of your, your opposition pretty well. Do you still place any importance on a publication like Sports Eye or, or Daily Racing Forum to, to uh, see how your competition has been doing before the race and study it? And part two is do you have any pre-race strategy with your catch driver give him any instructions? Well, the first part is if I have a horse that I think is good enough to go to a stake race, I try not to worry about my competition because, you know, that's going to psych you out. So if your horse is healthy and you feel like he can be competitive, I don't really worry about him. And as far as the driver, uh, once they've driven the horse, I only tell them what I feel that he feels like for that day. Otherwise, they're supposed to know the horse, and that's all I need to tell them. Chuck, we've seen a lot of, uh, over the last several years, a lot of uh, trainers using trotting hobbles, especially with the cheaper trotters. Is that a sign that uh, trainers are just losing their patience? Well, I think so, uh, especially on two-year-olds. Uh, they get a little sore and they start making breaks, so they put the trotting hobbles on them. Uh, if you check the records, probably horses that race when they're two with the trotting hobbles don't come on too much when they're three because they're, they're making them do something they really don't want to do. All right, Greg from Ocean, uh, a regular caller. Go ahead, Greg. Holly, Chuck. Uh, Chuck, Jimmy Tackett was on the show last week, and he said that uh, McLeville did not have good confirmation, as you pointed out like that. What made you decide to take him even with bad confirmation? Well, first of all, that was my first year training for Lou Guida, and he had me look at all the Mystic Parks. Uh, he was a colt that I saw up at Atlanta Lobel lead. Uh, he had a lot of energy to him, and he did trot well on the lead pony. Uh, he just didn't have very good confirmation in front, and he wasn't a big, very big horse. And the other trainers that Lou had all turned him down. So uh, I just passed him, uh, you know, knowing that I wanted a horse for Lou Guida. All right, we'll uh, take a break here, and uh, as we go to break, a reminder, in addition to racing, we've got great family fun on tap here at the Big M. Don't miss our McDonald's open house, rain or shine, Saturday morning, and our McDonald's Country Festival Memorial Day Monday. Fun for the whole family, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m., a Wild West show. We've got rides, face painters, a petting zoo, clowns, a chili cook-off, a hot dog eating contest, live music with the Tim Gillis Band, and racing at 110. We'll be back with more with Chuck Sylvester and Track Talk at the Big End.
Welcome back to Track Talk live at the Big M. It's our interactive show here on CN8 and at TheBigM.com. We're live on the Internet as well here in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Ken Warkin, Bob Hayden, and our special guest, Chuck Sylvester. And you can email your questions, TrackTalk at NJSEA.com. And we have an email question right now. Let's check it out here on Track Talk Live. Who would you rate, Chuck, as the top three trotters of all time? It comes from Sean uh, from West Orange, New Jersey. Well, that's, that's a hard question. Everybody rates them differently. Uh, you know, Mac Lobel has to be rated uh, uh, right there in the top three, uh, possibly Greyhound. Uh, and besides, after that, I mean, you can just throw a whole bunch of them in together. My money maker, I guess? Yeah, I mean, money maker is a great mare and raced for a long time, so she's definitely got to be there. Chuck, the first 10 Hamiltonian winners here at the Meadowlands average over 26 starts. The last 10 at the Meadowlands, less than half of that. What's happening there, and are we racing our trotters kind of like Bob Baffert's racing his triple crown thoroughbreds? Well, I think uh, the answer to that is speed. Uh, speed tears up horses now. They can't hold up like they used to. Uh, when you had 26, 28 starts, there was a lot of those starts that were in 2.6, 2.7, 2.8. Now all your starts are under two minutes, and most of the horses just can't stay sound going that fast. Okay, Scott from Illinois. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, yes, greetings to everybody tonight. Uh, Chuck, what do you think uh, Maxwell Bell could have time-trialed in when he was at his absolute best? Well, Mac had a you know, disposition of where... You know, we never could figure that out because he never give it all out. He won many a races eased up. I'm not sure uh, he could have really went fast in this day and age, but he never really would try for a whole mile. Uh, one time we tried at uh, Lex or Delaware to go a big mile with him. He got in front by 15, 20 lengths and drew up and waited everybody caught him, and then he went on and won the race. So if you ask him to do something he didn't want to do, uh, he wouldn't go on. All right, Dan, go ahead, Dan. Good evening, guys. Uh, listen, uh, Chuck, can you illustrate a little on how your uh, training of horses have changed over the years now that there's such an emphasis on speed with the elimination of the dual heats? Well, we used to train three and four trips all the time. Now my horses go two trips uh, twice a week, and sometimes they'll, only, they'll be on an eight-day training instead of seven days. Uh, and they'll only go three trips the first time they race. They'll warm up two trips and then race. And that way you're conservating and, and hope that they'll get through the long year. All right, James from Larchmount, New York. James, uh, where's your nearest racetrack, James? Hi, how you doing? I'm near the Meadowlands, actually. I come oh, okay. here often. There was a filly who used to w w race here a few years ago named uh, Miss Easy. And she was one of the best i ever seen race here. And I was just wondering whatever happened to her and if she has any offspring. I think she's owned by Steve Jones now, uh, up in Goshen, New York. Uh, she sold the coat last year, for, I think, for quite a bit of money. I'm not sure if he's raced yet, but he's a two-year-old this year, but she'll still have a chance, that mare. And I, irony of ironies, that uh, she was the daughter of, of Amity Chef, who was second in the Meadowlands pace that you won, but last, and he was last, I think, 10th, turn up for home that race. That's right. Yeah. Uh, when you're uh, training a trotter or breaking a two-year-old, uh, I read also in the article that you can train both, the, both ways of the track both the, the counterclockwise and clockwise. Yes, right. what happens is a lot of times uh, if you have a colt that's having trouble with his right hind, uh, we'll switch and train him the wrong way of the track and make it easier for him, uh, and then they'll learn to get confidence in herself and, and make speed that way. Are Pacers still on your resume, or is that a thing of the past? Well, it has been for a long time. I do have one filly this year I'm training, an Abercrombie filly, but uh, basically I don't get many Pacers to train anymore. All right, we'll take a time out here, and uh, as we go to break, let's show you one of four Classic Series fields tomorrow night. Last year's top older male trotter, Magician, and Dave Miller has been dominant in two previous legs. The only one eligible for the Series Sweep bonus of $250,000. Three to five morning line there. Good times, just went over $2 million himself. And please sack the 2000 Illinois Hoist of the Year was just a fifth off Pine Chips track and world record last week. He trotted a mile of 153. John Campbell will drive two hole there, four to one. Back with more Track Talk. This is Next. Track Talk at the Big M. Welcome back to Track Talk Live at the Meadowlands Racetrack, and we'll go right to the phones here. We've got Joe from Freehold, New Jersey. Go ahead, Joe. How you doing tonight, fellas? Great, Good. great. Go ahead. Uh, I want to ask uh, Mr. Sylvester a question. I'm, uh, I have some friends that have a two-year, three-year-old filly named Silence Hanover, and I just wanted to see what, how you compared it to a horse that won the 1997 Hamilton the Oaks named Continental Victory, and I want to see what your thoughts were on it. Well, what I saw her last year, I think she's qualifying tomorrow, but uh, what I saw her last year, she was very dominant 
if she improves at all, uh, she, there's a chance she'll be racing against the boys. Chuck, why do trainers not want to race on half mile tracks if they can avoid it anymore? Well, you know, it's the, it's the extra turns. It's so tough getting around the turns, uh, and it takes so much out of your horse that people just don't want to do it anymore. They're getting to be a thing of the past. Chuck, despite the uh, difficulty in adjusting to racetracks, uh, you're still the leading, one of the leading trainers, if not lead, the leading trainer in Breeders' Crown history. Uh, I caught you on an airplane going up to Mohawk one year, and, and you said that a lot of the horsemen had, a, had trouble with the track up there. Now, this year it's going to be at Woodbine. Well, Woodbine or Mohawk, I have problems with both of those tracks. I don't know why the first week it seems like you can get by. The second week for me, no matter what I do, I've been the favorite several times up there, and I can't get the job done. Incredible Abe, he won the 1994 Breeders' Crown. I didn't even realize that you trained him until after the race, and now Victory Dream was nailed on the wire. What kind of horse was he? Well, he was a very fast horse, a, a very lame horse. Uh, he didn't take much uh, work, basically just giving him a lot of rest in between trips. But he's a big gated horse, and he could go fast. Do you like the pressure of training these the, the high-level trotters? Oh, sure, that's fun. I mean, after you once go through it, uh, there's nothing more exciting than being in a big race like this to have the pressure to win. Is there anything that, uh, what are some of the things that you might do to gain an edge over your competition? Well, the biggest thing is I try to use John Campbell and mm -hmm. put a lot of pressure on him, so that really helps. All right, uh, Chuck Sylvester, maybe we'll see you in the winner's circle again on Saturday, August 4th, Hamiltonian Day. Good luck. I sure hope so, and thanks for having me. Great show today, and Bob Hayden, and on behalf of our entire broadcast team here at the Big M, we'd like to remind you that uh, if you'd like to catch up on everything that's happening in harness racing, Catch the Inside Track, our weekly magazine show tonight at midnight. The Inside Track with Bob Hayden and Dave Brower. And don't miss our show next week. Hall of Famer again, Ray Remen, the winningest stable in Meadowlands history. Join us for live action tonight. Saturday, open house. Saturday, we've got the Classic Series. And Monday, we've got live action. On behalf of our entire broadcast team, thanks for watching. We'll see you at the races here at the Meadowlands.